You're listening to BQN. Assimilate the audio. Good morning. I'm Chrissy DeClerc Salagi. And I'm Jason Salagi with today's Caffeinated History with the Salagis on the BQN Podcast Collective. Before we jump into our topic for the day, we'd like to take a moment to thank our BQN Patreon patrons who make our show possible. Listeners, you can hear your name listed here as one of our associate producers with a monthly subscription of just $10 at patreon.com slash BQN. And with a monthly Patreon subscription of $5 or more, you can join our meetings of the Hive Mind on the second Saturday of each month. Watch your Patreon messages for details. Today's topic is a brief history of the United Auto Workers in honor of their recent successful strike. We here at History with the Zalagis would like to express our solidarity with the UAW workers and congratulate them on their successes in the recent contract negotiations. Sometimes a strike is necessary. Perhaps surprisingly, the history of the United Auto Workers begins before the mass production of automobiles with the laborers who produced wagons and carriages. In 1891, the American Federation of Labor created the International Union of Carriages and Wagon Workers. In 1913, seeing the shift toward cars, the IUCWW added automobile to their name. But the AFL demanded that they remove this addition. When they refused, the AFL kicked them out. On the 2nd of September in 1918, they reformed as the United Automobile, Aircraft, and Vehicle Workers of America. This union thrived, reaching a membership of 45,000 in 1920 now under the name Auto Workers Union. This was their high point, as other auto unions pulled members away, and union membership became associated with communism, pushing people away from unionism in general. At their 1935 convention, these smaller locals sought to unify, creating the United Automobile Workers of America. At this same convention, the Committee for Industrial Organization, or the CIO, was formed. They focused on unskilled labor, which conflicted with the AFL's long-standing focus on skilled labor, and so the AFL pushed them out the next year. They renamed themselves the Congress of Industrial Organization, still the CIO, and took the UAW with them. These new unions took advantage of a recent law created under President Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal programs, the National Labor Relations Act of 1935, better known as the Wagner Act. This guaranteed the right of private sector employees to organize and collectively bargain with their employer. It even protected their right to strike. The UAW tested this during the next few years, most famously with the Flint sit-down strike from December of 1936 to February of 1937. This strike forced General Motors to recognize the union. Chrysler followed suit shortly thereafter, subsequent to a shorter strike. Of the major auto companies, Ford remained a holdout until the pressure of public opinion and the Roosevelt administration forced the issue in 1941. Ford had, prior to the Depression, even worked to undermine the calls for a union by increasing the pay for his workers to $5 a day. The UAW was instrumental in the United States' efforts in World War II, beginning even before the U.S. had entered the war. FDR encouraged a shift toward the production of war materials and away from consumer goods like cars. The heads of the auto companies didn't like this idea, believing it would cut into their profits. UAW President Walter Ruther supported the idea of transitioning existing factories to war production and suggested that if just some existing plants were reworked to produce airplanes, UAW workers would be able to produce 500 planes a day. His particular plan did not come into being, but the U.S. entry into the war in December of 1941 made the point moot. Americans needed war materials produced by American factories, whether the owners of the car companies liked it or not. And they also needed more workers. While the men went to war, women took up factory jobs. To pay women less was common across all industries at this time, including the auto companies, but the UAW pushed for these women to be paid equally to the men standing alongside them doing the same job. They were not always successful, but their efforts made sure that the women were paid better than they would have been. The UAW was less effective in gaining equal pay for African Americans and had mixed reactions in trying to assure equal treatment on the shop floor. The post-war era was a boom time for the United States, and that included auto workers. But as unions began bargaining to include pensions and health insurance, using strikes as leverage, Congress looked to reduce their power. Elements of the Wagner Act were undermined with new legislation. Solidarity strikes were outlawed, closed shops opened, 
and union political activities curtailed. Conservatives did all they could to associate unionism with communism, to the point that union officers were required to sign affidavits denying any association with the Communist Party. In 1950, after a long period of bargaining and then a strike, the UAW and GM came to an agreement sometimes called the Treaty of Detroit. The union agreed to a five-year contract in exchange for pensions and health insurance for the workers. These soon became the standard for workers across all industries, blue and white collar. The issue of health insurance has continued to be a sticking point for the UAW and other unions which also have members outside of the United States, as the U.S. is one of the few industrialized countries without government-provided health insurance or care, meaning that locals and their laborers elsewhere do not need to include that in their bargaining. Through the 1950s, American auto industry saw increasing competition from foreign automakers, notably Volkswagen. By the end of the decade, a recession prompted the loss of 300,000 auto jobs, a point that was used by conservatives to claim the demands of unions had caused the losses. They also blamed union contracts for high prices of goods coming out of unionized production, and the auto industry was an easy example. In fact, however, UAW President Ruther countered this by trying to include in negotiations elements that would lower prices, as this would, after all, also benefit the workers. But these never made it into a final contract. While a union's primary focus is in the workplace, it also has influence on people's lives away from work. With this in mind, the UAW was greatly involved in the civil rights movements of the mid-20th century. Walter Ruther gave Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. an office in the UAW headquarters building in Detroit, where he wrote some, if not all, of his famous dream speech. The UAW also funded some of the work for the 1963 March for Jobs and Freedom, where King gave that speech, and Ruther was one of the other speakers. The auto industry was hit hard by economic problems in the last decades of the 20th century, not the least of which were related to oil embargoes and gasoline shortages of the 1970s. Between this and an influx of cheaper cars that had better gas mileage, the UAW was forced into concessions time and again as the big three claimed they could not maintain wages while also competing with new imports. The Reagan administration, from 1981 to 89, also did everything they could to undermine workers and unions, beginning with his breaking of the strike of air traffic controllers in the summer of 1981. This and Reagan's deficient appointments at the National Labor Relations Board gave companies license to ignore the needs of their laborers and the unions who represented them. At the same time, some union leaders allied with management, either hoping to help their members or with an eye to double dealing to their own benefit. At times, even the union members saw the organization as working against them. The labor issues of the 1990s primarily surrounded the North American Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA, which allowed American companies to outsource elsewhere on the continent where they could pay lower wages, provide fewer, if any, benefits, and maintain lower safety standards, all while keeping prices the same. This followed into the automaker's worsening financial situation in the first decades of the 21st century. As older workers retired, the cost of their pensions and benefits became a growing portion of the company's costs. Additionally, higher fuel prices during the Iraq and Afghanistan wars led many Americans to trade their SUVs and trucks, which had been the heart of the American market, for better mileage smaller cars, many from Japanese or German automakers. When the financial markets crashed in 2008, both GM and Chrysler filed for bankruptcy in order to reorganize. The UAW was presented by these companies with the choice of either accepting concessions in the form of reduced wages and benefits, or seeing all of the jobs disappear because the companies collapsed. These were, of course, supposed to be temporary measures, but after the emergency had ended and contracts came up for renewal, there were always reasons not to restore the workers to their pre-2008 condition. These issues came to a head amidst negotiations beginning in the spring of 2023. The recently elected UAW President Sean Fain presented a hard line to the automakers. With drastically rising profits over the last few years, there is no reason not to restore to the workers what they had conceded in the emergency situation of 2008. With both sides at an impasse, Fain held a vote of the membership to approve a strike. 97% voted in favor. The strike began on the 14th of September in 2023. It was organized as a rolling strike, meaning that not all members would walk out at once, but that specific plants would be targeted, with additions scheduled as long as a tentative deal was not reached. Fain called this a stand-up strike, in a nod to the 1936 sit-down strike in Flint that forced GM to recognize the union. Approximately 50,000 workers from GM, Ford, and Stellantis struck between the 14th of September and the 30th of October. Tentative agreements were reached separately with each company. Ford on the 25th of October, Stellantis three days later, 
and GM on the 30th. These new contracts address the most important issues of concern, particularly pay increases and removal of the system that was keeping workers in a temporary status in order to pay them even less. As of this writing, the contracts have not yet been fully ratified by the membership, but are expected to be soon. Always remember, united we bargain, divided we starve. Thank you for listening. We'd also like to thank our History with the Sloggies Patreon patrons, Patty, Susan Capuzzi de Clerc, Chris Hill, Laura Dull, and Vince Locke. Their contributions help us to have the time to research and write what you're hearing. You can help us just like they do with a monthly subscription at patreon.com slash history with the Zaloggies. Also, thank you to Mark White for the great show art and Zach Tripp for the beautiful closing music. Please subscribe in your favorite podcast player and don't forget to rate and review us there as well. And while you're at it, check out the rest of the great shows on the BQN Collective. We'd love to hear what you think. If you'd like to reach out, you can find our network on Twitter at BQN Podcasts and this podcast in particular at History's Loggy. You can also talk about any and all of the BQN podcasts in our Facebook group, the BQN Collective. And last but not least, you can find me on Twitter and Blue Sky at the Goddess Livia. That's T H E G O D D E S S L I V I A. And me at Jason Dark Elf. We'd love to hear topic suggestions. What would you like to learn on caffeinated history? <laughs>